Uh, so I'm uh, Steve Griffin, one of the uh, third year pediatric residents, and this is a NICU journal club. Um, so titled Rooming In with uh, COVID-19, I found a decent article uh, from JAMA Pediatrics that we can go through. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little on the short side, so either fortunately or unfortunately, you guys will get out a little early today, um, depending on if uh, journal analysis is your thing. Um, so we'll dive into it. Uh, chat is also up if you have questions or comments as we go. Feel free to type them in. Uh, or Janie can unmute you, and you can uh, throw uh, your two cents in as well. All right. So I have no disclosures, nothing relevant. Uh, no one's paying me to, to give this outside of Carillion. Um, so our objective is going to be using the PICO TT format, uh, which we use throughout the kind of journal clubs. Uh, that'll be to help us formulate a specific question then dive into you know, how to find a, a study uh, that answers your clinical question, which we have. Um, we'll review the prospective cohort study format. Quick, uh, quick review of it. We're not diving into a big stats lesson here. Um, and then look at uh, internal and external validity of the article. Um, and then review how this might change either current practice and guidelines um, with nursery during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, big clinical question that was going around a lot when the pandemic first came out was, can infants born to mothers positive for COVID-19 or under investigation uh, safely room in with their newborns? Um, and the, the data wasn't really out there because it was new and everyone was trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and so that leads us to our article that we found uh, titled, The Evaluation of Rooming in Practice for Neonates Born to Mothers with um, Basically COVID-19. Uh, from uh, northern Italy, and that was just because that's they had the biggest outbreak first, and so they had the most data. And this article comes out of JAMA Pediatrics, um, circa December 2020, um, but the actual study itself was done, as you'll see, in early uh, spring. So breaking it down, um, PCOTT is obviously a, an acronym to help us remember how to, to break, break things up. Um, so for our population. It's going to be infants uh, as mothers positive for COVID-19. Uh, the intervention, uh, basically what we were studying with the exposure, um, so to speak, for a, a cohort study was rooming in uh, with the infant mother dyad if mom was positive. And the comparison intervention was not rooming in, um, basically splitting up the infant and the child if mom was positive. And that was actually starting to happen uh, in, in different parts of Italy because they weren't sure Basically, no one knew what was going to, going to happen if the infant would get it, how their outcomes would be. So the safest thing some hospital thought was to split them up until um, basically everyone was, was uh, over their illness. And then uh, our outcome measured was uh, were infants testing positive for COVID-19 after rooming in, after breastfeeding with, uh, with mom who was tested positive. So our type of question was prognostic. Basically, we're looking to see what happens as time goes on. And then it's a cohort study. Um, and actually, it turns out to be a little more observational uh, just due to there not being a control group because so many people were positive um, in Italy. So ours happens to be prospective because they were able to get their data first and then follow them on um, instead of retrospective, which uh, helps out a little bit. So a brief review of our um, cohort studies. So they're called cohort studies because you get a large population with similar exposures. Um, in our case, they happen to be uh, all COVID positive. And then you follow that group for a time looking for your anticipated outcome, um, either the null hypothesis or the anticipated outcome that you got. And then these can be retrospective or prospective. Um, more commonly, it's prospective. Um, and retrospective seems to uh, decrease your efficacy of the study just because there's a little bit more bias introduced when people are thinking back years, uh, doing surveys, you know, as you pick up data, as you go, it's just going to be a little more accurate. So prospective can yield a little more uh, true incidence rates just because you're basically calculating the incidence as you pick up the data. Um, like I said, less prone to that recall bias. Um, you know, if you call someone up for 10 years from now and ask about uh, birth and delivery, they may lose a few details. And then uh, larger population size is more helpful to establish true outcomes of these kind of studies. I think that's pretty true for all studies. Uh, the more people, the more power you get out of it. Um, and then these can be used to establish uh, risks. 
and basically an odds ratio after your outcome uh, for your study exposure. But unfortunately, that was not done in our study, and we'll kind of dive into why. So breaking down our study, um, hopefully uh, some people on the line got a chance to read it so we can kind of um, discuss more at the end. Um, but our population was infants. They used uh, term and late term in their inclusion, or late, yeah, late preterm. In our inclusion, um, they just defined that as 37 to 42 weeks. <clears throat> and the, that was term, and then the late preterm was older than 34 weeks and larger than two kilos. And these were born to mothers um, COVID-19 positive. Um, in Lombardy, Italy, which is in the northern part of Italy. Um, study period went from March 19th to May 2nd, and the uh, um, mother and children were followed until day of life 20. So as we talked about earlier, the exposure was rooming in and breastfeeding under the study protocol with uh, moms who were positive. And we'll kind of dive into what exactly that study protocol was in the next couple slides. Um, inclusion criteria were uh, mothers who were COVID-19 positive uh, 14 days prior to delivery, and then up to they just the study just says a couple days after birth, but they were tracking about two to five days after birth as well. Um, and then the exclusion criteria was any infant that tested positive on day one of life, basically immediately after birth. They wanted to exclude those to look at basically is this causing transmission and not vertical transmission. So for any vertical transmission was excluded. Um, and then also if they did not give informed consent, um, I did add that just because I think this is the only study I've read that actually listed not giving consent as an exclusion criteria, but it would be that for everything. So what was their protocol? So um, in the room, mothers would try to have their bed about two meters, so six feet away um, from infants, except during care times. Um, they were given a document in education when they came in um, pre-labor. Um, they would be given an educational session on proper hand washing. Um, this study protocol, which was using clean linens, they would have a stack of clean blankets, so you would wrap the baby in a clean blanket um, prior to every care time. Um, how to, you know, how long they should wash their hands. Um, if they're not washing their hands, they're using the like alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Um, and then what PPE mom would have to wear while she was in the room. Staff would all wear full PPE, obviously, because mom was COVID positive. So um, goggles, gowns, gloves, N95, the whole nine yards. Um, moms, though, would just wear a surgical mask. Um, they would perform hand washing prior to any uh, handling of the infant, feeding, uh, care times. Uh, but they didn't have to wear the gowns or the eye protection or gloves. Um, they also... Something pop up in chat. Kevin asks, not sure if I missed in the article what type of COVID test. Uh, so I'll get to that in the next slide. Um, but they didn't specifically mention anyone being excluded for possible like past infection. Um, and then uh, they also mentioned that expressed breast milk went through a quote unquote sterilization process. They didn't quite mention what that was, like if the pumps were sterilized a certain way, if like the equipment, uh, if mom had like a, did any like uh, cleaning to the breast or anything before breastfeeding um, or before expressing breast milk. Um, so that wasn't really uh, delineated outside of it was quote unquote sterilized um, prior to feeding the infant. Uh, they also had an uh, addendum to, or, or appendices to the study that went through this protocol. Um, and it was basically all that was listed here. It was given to them in the educational format, in person, so nursing education, and then um, also given to them as a paper to take home with them. There was also a discharge protocol when they would go home, and this protocol talked about basically everything, reiterated everything that was in the rooming in protocol, but had uh, more stringent guidelines on social distancing, um, like don't leave your house, uh, keep the baby at home until they did the follow-up test um, and just really kind of emphasized um, using the gloves and uh, the same protocol they used in the hospital at home. All right, and diving into the testing for Kevin. Um, infants, they were tested with the nasopharyngeal swab, um, and this was then sent for PCR analysis. Um, again, if there was any... Um, 
past infection on mom, it would probably have lumped them into the study uh, just because as, as, as long as they tested positive, they were able to be uh, in the study. Uh, the flip side of that is everyone was being tested in Italy because of their rates. Um, so you came into the hospital while being pregnant for the possible delivery, you got tested, whether you had symptoms or not. Um, and so that we'll get into that at the end of how that may skew things. But uh, so you have a lot of asymptomatics as well. Um, but you were tested at day one of life, um, day seven of life, and again at day 20 at an outpatient follow-up clinic that was exclusively uh, for COVID-19. And um, infants were discharged home after day seven, uh, their day seven test. I'm not sure how long in Italy they normally uh, keep newborns, but uh, it's, they didn't make it clear if they held them until day seven uh, in the study, just purely for the study. Um, but all the infants uh, appeared healthy and didn't have any issues. Um, they were also given uh, written guidance, like we talked about this addendum that was printed out um, on how to care for the child at home. It was the same protocol of, on, after I reviewed it. Um, and they, I guess, hoped for the best adherence and sent them home for uh, follow-up about uh, 13 days later. So breaking down, these are the demographics of mom, um, the big, uh, point, things to point out is the end of the study is about 61. Um, it's not the, the largest study, but that was uh, how many over the study period they got to agree to the study. Um, and then uh, some other issues uh, during pregnancy was rupture of membranes happened in about 13% or eight mothers uh, greater than 18 hours. Um, and there was uh, foul smelling amniotic fluid in one but otherwise, um, there was only one infant that needed um, like resuscitation in the delivery room. And um, if you look at it, we have a, about three or set three quarters of 75% split of uh, vaginal deliveries to cesarean section. Um, and then as you see down at the bottom of this table, the uh, number of symptoms of diagnosis I think is somewhat telling. Um, so about 55% of the study had absolutely zero symptoms of diagnosis. These were just people coming in getting tested because they were in the hospital. Uh, and the ordinance in Italy at the time was test everyone. Um, and so I think the, it picked up a lot of asymptomatic people that if they came in a, uh, not being globally tested uh, may not have been tested at all. Uh, and then the numbers did change somewhat for a number of symptoms of delivery and they didn't really delve into why that was, um, whether they got diagnosed afterwards or uh, if their symptoms resolve prior to delivery. And then this dives into kind of the newborn demographics and the uh, results are included in here as well. So there was one set of twins in the study. Um, that's why there's 62 neonates and 61 uh, mothers. Um, gestational age was average about 39. Um, there was uh, six late preterm births. But uh, you can see their birth weights, their averages there were um, all on the, the more term, higher size. And only one got resuscitation after birth. This was listed in the study as um, ventilation with a mask, but it didn't go into if it was just CPAP, if it was PPV, and then the kid came off, went to room air, and uh, went to newborn nursery. Um, APGARs were all good as well. Is anybody surprised that there were a lot of tens? A little bit. I usually don't trust a 10 when I get them. And then going through, obviously there was a zero positivity at birth because that would have excluded them from the study like we talked about. Um, at day of life seven, only one infant had uh, converted positive. Um, and at day of 20, that same infant was still positive. Um, there was no other uh, positivities in the study. So the uh, COVID related symptoms on our one infant that tested positive, his mother seemed to be a little more severe. She initially came in with uh, just some mild cough, was her only symptom listed, and rapidly progressed around day five to um, needing to go to the ICU, was eventually intubated for about 14 days, uh, but didn't make it uh, and was able to discharge home later. Um, and around uh, day, that was the same infant on day seven during his uh, protocol test, tested positive but was only noticed to have mild dyspnea, um, was transferred to the NICU, mostly because mom had to go to the ICU. Um, did not say that he ever went on oxygen or any respiratory support. They just called it transient dyspnea, and then he uh, did find with actually discharge home with dad while mom was still in the hospital. Um, so 
delving into kind of rates of breastfeeding as far as exposures to the infants, we had about a 73% um, exclusive breastfeeding, um, which I think is a good, uh, good bit of exposure for these kids if we're really trying to get them to convert and test positive uh, with mom being positive. And then uh, only 5% were exclusively using formula but still rooming in with mom. Uh, and luckily there was no death uh, three weeks after birth that was noted in the study as well. So for the results, uh, continuing, just 82% were able to complete uninterrupted rooming in, means they never had to go to the nursery, go to the NICU. Um, their threshold for NICU seemed a little bit uh, on the lower side as well. So one child was sent to NICU due to the maternal decline we talked about. Um, others went due to just get phototherapy because their belly went high, um, and the others were just diagnosed with poor feeding um, in the first uh, 24 hours, but were able to uh, come back uh, and continue rooming in after that first day. Um, and then, yeah, we talked about that same child was the one that converted on day seven and was positive at day 20 as well. So overall, uh, in the study, people did uh, quite well. The children did well, the moms did well, um, and everyone was able to room in even while continuing to breastfeed um, with very low rates of transmission, um, as long as the protocol was followed, of course. So breaking into our critical traceability article, and people can feel free to jump in the chat if anybody in the room has thoughts as well. Um, but was the cohort assembled at a common point in time? Um, yes, anyone coming into the hospital prior uh, to delivery um, and in that term, uh, late preterm range, they were all tested at the same time um, throughout their course. Um, and as far as patient follow-up long enough, they only followed them up for 20 days. Um, so I think the follow-up could have been a little bit longer as well. Um, 20 days, you still have kind of all the fresh memories of the protocol. Um, you know, from the hospital and all the teaching that you got. So what that does is I think it excludes a little bit of like mask fatigue or pandemic fatigue. Uh, if anyone's gone to Walmart recently, they can see plenty of people that are not wearing masks anymore. So if you add in a newborn going home, waking up at 3 a.m. to feed, and you're having to do hand washing and get a clean blanket and put a mask on prior to doing any breastfeeding care time, I think those numbers might have skewed as time went on. Um, and obviously not apply in the blind fashion, uh, just because you can't withhold that mom's COVID positive from mom just for the sake of the study. I think, you know, from a patient, if the patient follows long enough, if you make it even longer in the situation of COVID fatigue, um, could they be exposed like outside? Like COVID fatigue, yeah. Were dads allowed in the room, or care, other caregivers, or is only mom's right? Just mom. That was only in the hospital, but at home everybody but at home everybody was there, yeah. And then they didn't really dive into it. They're hoping that everyone was following the same protocol, but right. mom was the only one that got it in the hospital, like the education part of it. Um, and that was the other part that would really confound everything is if, you know, then you're, you're exposing them from everybody and um, people may throw the protocol out the window um, or, you know, grandparents visit, and it's a pretty high prevalence rate uh, in the community as well. Um, they may also have been thinking that past 20 days, if mom was positive pre-birth, she would be out that 21-day window. Um, so that might be why they chose 20 days as well. Um, and diving into external validity, um, how likely are the outcomes over time? Um, so it seems like the outcomes are a little low. Um, unfortunately, I can't throw a lot of like data crunching or confidence intervals at you just because we didn't have a control group. Um, so we don't really have, you're not able to make that, you know, two by two square. You're not able to really calculate odds ratios or risk ratios. Um, but it seems like with one out of 60, 62 um, seems pretty pretty good outcome over time, so low likelihood. Um, and then how pro precise the prognostic estimates. Um, again, we talked about there's not really any prognostic estimates in this just because they can really calculate it. And then can you apply this to your own patients, to your own nursery? Um, I would say cautiously yes, as long as the study protocol is followed. Um, you obviously can't play fast and loose with, um, you know, just COVID positive moms and letting them go. Um, but as long as you follow the same protocol in the study, um, which is hand washing and face masking, which pretty much I think everyone's been doing since last March, um, you can apply this to your patients. Um, 
I talked to um, some of the staff up here, and then if you guys have any um, uh, input as well, I think this is pretty much what we're doing for COVID positive moms here as well. My is even seven days. Right, yeah, right. We don't keep them for that long, but we do check the babies for the COVID. And if, I don't know what happened in the clinic, but in my recollection, I've not seen any baby that has turned to be positive and the mom is positive. And we had a lot of COVID moms, so just our internal data says babies don't turn positive and at least one to two days they are here. Okay. Things could change as an outpatient. Do you check the babies for COVID as an outpatient when they come? Not to unless the they're symptomatic. Yeah, and at that point, you know, they're under two months, so we would kind of go more down the, you know, sepsis workup mm -hmm. pathway too, um, especially if they start getting temperature instability. Um, but I can't say I've tested anybody. It's okay. more presumed if parents are positive, they're going to stay home for 14 days anyway with the little one. So. Doctor Warden, to pick you. Okay. Hey guys. So Stephen, I was curious, um, what's your thoughts on the, the title of this article? Do, if I read it, you know, evaluation of rooming in practices for neonates born to mothers with severe, you know, acute respiratory syndrome, COVID-2 infection. And I'm not sure that we could argue that those mothers were, yes, they, they tested positive, but did they really have this, you know, the severe acute respiratory component of it? Um, you know, they didn't specify, and I don't think they were that these mothers were on oxygen. Um, you know, this, this data was collected kind of at the start of when Lombardi was hit really hard and they were the big epicenter for it. Um, so I'm not sure if it would, if it would be beneficial to reword it because when we strategize based on treatment, um, you know, to be hospitalized, you know, it changes whether we give a patient certain medications if they're on oxygen. So I'm not sure. And, and it, to me, when I read that, you really only had one mother who had the, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 infection um, that was clinically significant, um, you know, that required ICU. Yeah, that was uh, one of the things I noticed. And I'm thinking that might have been skewed because they tested so many people. Um, and they didn't list it as an exclusion criteria, but they certainly didn't have, uh, for the multi-center um, style of the study, they didn't have anyone who was pregnant in the ICU, anything like that, like they're mentioning. Um, so it was all very um, clinically stable moms that came in and got tested with a large amount of asymptomatic as well. So it seems like they might have gone for the, uh, the eye-grabbing title uh, first. Yeah, I think they're going for semantics of they're calling it SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. or COVID-19 as opposed to COVID-19. And the SARS portion, where when you spell it out, it's severe, severe respiratory yeah. syndrome, that's the misleading portion. Even though they're looking at if you have COVID-19 positivity, you are SARS-CoV-2. And then, Stephen, I was wanting to, you know, this is an interesting time with with articles like this because everyone was very hungry to get data out there and and to to analyze it especially the nick the neon nicu world uh, us in the picu as well um you know this is a jama article um higher impact factor this was lombardi you know editor-in-chief of jama is a pediatrician um i was wanting to see if you were to to build on this what to, to better answer your question, how would you design a study to build on this to answer your question? I mean, I think they covered, um, A, I think the N needs to be a little bigger. They have a multi-center study, but not everyone, uh, there's only about 61 mothers. So building uh, a little more power with some more population. Um, I don't know if it would confound it too much, but if you, um, also included like uh, preterm infants, so possibly if uh, COVID was, you know, causing like preterm labor or anything like that. Um, and then also including um, like ICU, um, more critically ill parent, uh, critically ill mothers that were actually undergoing treatment or getting treatment for COVID-19 um, may give us a little more variables to look at. Right now it seems kind of 2D or, or, or single faceted. But would they definitively be able to in? Probably not, um, because if they were sick enough, they would transfer the kids to the NICU so mom could, could recover. I'd be interested if there were any differences between 
regular care of a baby where there's no rules about like keeping them six feet from the mom and like I don't know how well that was actually followed in this study anyway, but just I mean when they go home they're not gonna really do that. Yeah. They, so it would be interesting to see if, like, actual care of your baby would transfer COVID or not. Or even, like, a survey at the end of, like, an honest, like, did you follow the protocol for these 13 days? Um, because they just, I guess, assumed honesty was the best policy and everyone followed it. Um, so they didn't have any data from that either. And your point with it being a smaller study, if you had larger numbers, could you kind of delineate out your asymptomatic carriers? Mm -hmm. And your sense, you know, I lost my taste and smell but I'm not needing any oxygen. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that might have skewed some of the data too, because if you're so many people are asymptomatic, you're not having those aerosol generating like cough, sneezing uh, symptoms that you know may cause increased transmissibility. Well, the other thing I would say, this article was published, when this study was done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody else would be looking. Did you, mm -hmm. you come up with like, any more studies talking about the effect of the breast milk, you know, we give moms who breast milk feed breast milk because the babies have got less COVID or I'm sure. I didn't find any um, definitively for that. There was some talk at the end of the study about um, potentially breastfeeding being protective, um, but that wasn't really delved into in this at all. Now that we're learning more, I mean, because when this came out, this is March until May, May yeah. and Grand Europe was hit. Europe and Asia were hit kind of before we got uh, hit, right? Uh, everybody was making, you know, they were, uh, uh, like Dr. Ward said, everybody was just kind of desperate to get some information out. And that's also because we were all fine by the seat of our own hands. I mean, we closed our NICU parents to mm -hmm. We just didn't know. And now our numbers are way higher and we're still letting families. Obviously, safety would be a factor, but the more clinically relevant question might actually be to say, you've got this group of parents, we're going to tell you what our recommendations are as far as isolation, but you can do what you want to because right. you're going to. And it takes a little bit of your question mark of what are they going to do when they get home out of it. Mm -hmm. Because they're just going to go ahead and be like, I don't feel like that part's important, I'm not going to do it, and see what your transmission rate is when people act the way they're normally going to anyway. Mm -hmm. One thing about kind of how they act, I mean, so initially with our newborn nursery, which is really kind of describing what um, the protocol for this, you know, because once the mother who was super sick got sick, essentially they were separated because the infant then had to be in a private room. And the one mom we've had who was COVID positive the baby was able to go to Well Baby Nursery, but was not with mom because she was in an ICU. Um, with, and initially, you know, we were recommending separation of all mothers and babies when they were first born um, if mom was COVID positive, regardless of symptoms. Um, now they were given the option with you know the social distancing practices pretty much as described in this article um but you know based on some of this early data we said you know what rooming in if particularly if both people or both mom and baby in the diet are well is not any higher risk than if they're um at following the guidelines and the reality is though the vast majority aren't following guidelines. Every time I went into the room, the baby was in mom's arms. Most of the time with a mask, not always. Um, and so, um, you know, there is a bit of these people are going to be doing what they're going to do. Even in the hospital, they weren't fully following the guidelines. Um, so I would imagine um, similar in Italy, you know, in terms of maintaining that six, the crib six feet away, um, you know, only picking them up for like care times. Um, most of the time when I went into these rooms, these infants were being held. And that's
Dr. Yeah, it's Dr. Ward again. You know, that, that begs the question, if we were going to design a f future study with this, you know, could you, could you ethically have, do we have enough data to say that we ethically feel comfortable in having a control group to where we, we let those patients and families um, room in together and not go with the guidelines? You know, is it strong enough based on this article? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, that necessarily if that's the case. Um, the other point is, you know, if, if you're going to design another one, looking at viral loads with the mother and the, and the baby and trending them over time every couple of days may be helpful um, as well. I just, this is Lisa, I just think that the importance of this, if you remember back in March and April, that we didn't know what to do with the babies at all. And the importance of this, because, you know, Steve, you say you are seeing when you see the babies outpatient, they're not, uh, they're not symptomatic at least. You haven't been testing them, but the big thing is you, what it looks like is you can leave a baby in a room with instructions. You don't have to separate them completely like we were trying to do. And I think since the majority of the people are asymptomatic, that's really, this is important just to say, if you're asymptomatic and you're positive, you're probably okay to be with your baby. You got to remember kind of the initial reports from China, they were separating these mothers and babies 100% for four, I believe it was 14 days, but an extended period of time. Um, you know, so I think, you know, in terms of, you know, saying which would your control group be, you know, in the early days, your control group would be complete isolation of this infant for 14 days. Um, so as opposed to, you know, doing full care with no guidelines, the original control group would actually have been the reverse, the opposite situation. and you know so this really says yeah it's okay for these kids to be with mom with socially distancing practices you know could we even say can they be with mom without those practices involved that gets a little more tricky and would that be ethically um feasible probably not but again my question would be the opposite question and you know what we were asking early on is can we allow these families or these mom and baby dyads to be together. Um, and I think this did help answer that question. Thank you for this. Uh